All right, you got this John Green video. He talks fast, but he does a pretty good job there explaining some of the, uh, you know, first key terms in terms of the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists. The textbook actually does a good job too, but I want to throw my two cents in as well. It's nice to kind of get this from different perspectives. So I've, I've written out here for you um, this idea of like the Federalists, the Democratic Republicans, loose constructionists, strict constructionists, but that's kind of a lot of terms. So just to, again, kind of put it in different words for you. Um, once they realize, right, the Founding Fathers realize this is, um, you know, we got the Constitution, so let's, you know, get to the habit of, of governing. You know, as I noted in the text, uh, Washington really recognizes that what he does is going to set a precedent, that, that the Constitution provided the instruction that's supposed to happen, but you know, there's still some interpretation there. And so um, I gave you the example of the Senate, like discussing names for the president um, as, as an example of like recognizing how much of a precedent this is gonna set. And so Hamilton, he's the first secretary of the treasury. Hamilton really feels like the future of the country rests with, you know, strong industry we need to we, we're still too connected to the british economy he thinks we need to like become more independent create our own national bank um but uh, others are like no 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 the constitution doesn't say anything about a national bank you can't have a national bank hamilton says you know what the constitution doesn't say i can't have a national bank and the means of getting to create a national bank doesn't say anything about that so it should be okay to have a national bank. That's a loose constructionist interpretation of the constitution. Others like Jefferson say, no, dude, mm -mm. doesn't say we can't have, it doesn't say anything about national bank. We cannot have a national bank. That's a strict construction. It's like a strict interpretation. Like, there's no gray area um, here. And people like Jefferson also think that the future of the country rests with small farmers, you know, owning a piece of the land. And um, so, you know, so, so right from the get go, right, we can see we've got two different ways of kind of, uh, of where we're headed. Um, the Whiskey Rebellion then plays into this because, um, again, Hamilton wants to create this stronger uh, economy. And so he places a tax on whiskey. And it's not, it's not his intention that the tax is going to impact small farmers more, but that's just what ends up happening. It's like logistics of transferring the whiskey and whatnot. So the further away you are, the more rural you are, the harsher this tax is gonna feel for you. And so, um, right, we have a tradition, right? Established in the colonial period. We didn't like something, what do you do? You have a protest, you rise up, right? Um, and so that's what they do. But remember, we talked last week, the Constitution says something about domestic violence, that, that um, in, in the event of domestic violence, the federal government can put down those incidences of um, insurrection. And so this is what happens. They go in there with thousands and thousands of troops and try to put down this rebellion. And, and you know, again, it's not in terms of um, like loss of life and damage of property. It's not this huge dramatic thing, but it sets that precedent. You know, if you don't like something, you don't get to just rise up and have a rebellion. We've, we've established ways of protesting that in the constitution. And so that's another example of Washington kind of setting that precedent, um, but also of that divide, right? The differing ways of interpreting things. Um, meanwhile, uh, in the world, uh, we're getting different views of interpreting things. France is having a revolution. And um, initially we both support it. We're like feeling, or both Federalists and Democratic Republicans support it. They're like, yay, you know, look at us. We have a revolution. Now the French are gonna have a revolution. Um, but then, right, the uh, French um, execute their king and queen. And so we're like, whoa, at least the, the Federalists are like, whoa, 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 that's too far. And even the Democratic Republicans, right, they're not gonna support the execution of the king and queen, but they continue to support the revolution. And so that's another way that these two sides start to differ is in their support of the French Revolution. The um, Federalists, again, are a little, yeah, and the Democratic Republicans are still like, you know, 
all about the French. And so um, in the midst of all this, Washington sets another precedent and serves two terms and then steps down, which you kind of got to give him some credit for that because really Washington, he could have called himself king. Um, and again, you know, one of the titles they considered was his majesty. He was so revered. He could have just kept kept serving. You know, there's no term limits when the Constitution is written for the president. That's um, going to change after, if you go on to History 8, that's going to change after FDR. So he, you got, we'll have to give him a little bit of credit for that one. Uh, you know, walking away from that that position and that power. And so in the election of 1796, the way the Constitution is initially written, the person who gets the most votes becomes president and the runner-up becomes vice president. So, you know, imagine this, John Adams gets the most votes, he's the Federalist, and uh, Democratic Republican Thomas Jefferson comes in second. Can you imagine having uh, people from two different political parties as president and vice president? As you could probably imagine, that's not gonna work very well. And so that's gonna ultimately be changed. We'll amend the constitution to fix that problem. But meanwhile, we got John Adams as president and Thomas Jefferson as his vice president. And so um, the XYZ affair, what happens here is there are still some unresolved issues with the English from the American Revolution. And so um, uh, we're trying to work those out. Oh, that's. That's the Jay Treaty. So there's these unresolved issues. That's actually a little before the election of 1796. There's these unresolved issues with the English that we're trying to work out. So we send some diplomats over to England to deal with those. It's just about like um, forts that are still here, enslaved peoples that were taken. And so people are sent over to England to try to hammer out those issues. But when we do that, the French are like, hey, what are you doing over there? Right, that looks suspicious to them. And so because of that, when Adams becomes president, he's got to send some diplomats over to France. This is the XYZ affair. The French say, sure, we'll meet with you, but they they, they uh, propose a bribe. They want us to pay to meet with them. And we're like, no, we're not gonna pay you. But remember, Adams is a Federalist and Jefferson and his guys are Democratic Republicans. Federalists are meh on the French, remember? And the Democratic Republicans are like, go France. And so when Adams diplomats are moving kind of slowly in meeting with the French, because the French are demanding a bribe, the Democratic Republicans back over in the United States are like, oh, you don't wanna meet with them anyway. You're just dragging your feet, like you're not in this. So Adams, releases his correspondence with his diplomats, where the diplomats you know, are writing about there's a bribe, they're dragging, you know, we're not dragging our feet, we're trying to do this, but this is what's happening. But the names are changed to X, Y, Z. And so when it's published in the newspapers, people are like, Bleh! they get angry, right? Because, you know, who are the French demanding this? And, and they also imply that there are spies, that the French have sent spies and they're trying to infiltrate the government and they're trying to overthrow us. And so what do we tend to do when we are fearful of war, when um, our economy isn't doing so great? Well, before we saw this with the Salem witchcraft trials, right? We find scapegoats. And so that's what's gonna happen with the Alien Sedition Acts. We're gonna find scapegoats. Um, and this is one of the most egregious abuses of our civil liberties. And again, ironic that some of the very people that wrote the Constitution then seem to completely disregard um, several of the Bill of Rights uh, with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, you've got uh, an explanation of those in the text and then also in American Yop in the textbook as well. So. Uh, this video is getting longer than I'd like to, to make it, but oh, so many terms there I needed to go over with y'all. All right, take care.